110 days after the storm, I mean, does it look like that to you? It looked like there was even a storm here? <laughs> what, what have you seen? Because in certain areas it looks like it happened yesterday. Yeah, it, it was pretty far reaching. It was just nothing that anyone has ever seen. So this surge, and this is right our area, right here. Right where they circled? Yes. Those are the streets we were in. This is huh. Kissam Avenue, and this is Fox Beach right here. Mm. So that was the center of the storm. It's amazing. This area in particular has a history of hurricanes um, and a history of flooding. In, I think, 38, there was a big one. In 61, there was a big one. But then in 92, there was a nor'easter. It wasn't even a hurricane. Where this whole area got between five and seven feet of water, just from an unnamed storm. The seawall that you just see there, the berm was almost destroyed in 92, mm -hmm. and the seawall was compromised. Mm -hmm. So they had a series of floods, and the Army Corps of Engineers were here, uh, did a bunch of studies. And finally, in 2000, it took them <laughs> from 92 to 2000, eight years, for them to finally do a temporary fix. And that kept things kind of okay for a certain amount of years, but you see this here, all these tall grass? The whole area is basically a floodplain. It's called the Blue Belt in Staten Island. And the purpose of this whole area, you see the houses are right in the middle of it, mm -hmm. it's uh, basically a stormwater retention program. It was done initially when the houses started to be built mm -hmm. and then it was they started to expand it recently mm -hmm. because a lot of this land that you see from here to the Kissimmee Avenue on the other side, mm -hmm. a lot of that's private land. Mm -hmm. People who are waiting to develop it. This was a 500 square foot uh, bungalow, a one-story bungalow. And he, over the last 11 years, did additions, so he just finished it, and this wrought iron fence right here was the last thing he did after 11 years, and he was finally done in September of 2012, and the storm came a month later. So he had 11 years of work. If you go into the whole first level, this was 10 feet of war, the whole first level is completely taken out. And uh, so you can see he cuts back to Phragmites here. That's only after he finally was allowed to do it in 2008. His house, the house next to him, that house, they were all damaged by a fire that started in this brush and there's, there's fires here every year because they're extremely, extremely flammable. So well, um, so now, so DEC allows you now to cut back since then, but then that fire went up to the berm and it damaged the berm. So starting in 2008, it flooded every single year, several times a year. How quick was a house structurally seemingly okay to when it wasn't? Our understanding is it seemed the water came over the berm and it came over, the surge was somewhere between nine and 12, or mm. some people say 15 feet. But what happened is, there's a, there's a water treatment plant over here, a sewage mm -hmm. plant. The water came over there, and then it came around the plant, and when, after it came around the plant, there's a couple of, uh, there's a row of houses relatively new, they're built in like 2002, but yet when they were built, they weren't built like stormproof. The, mm. Their heating systems are still on the first floor. Mm. The codes had already changed, so mm. the heating system should have been on the second floor. Mm. So the homeowners are all saying now, how, why, why did we get flooded and why did we lose our heat? Why did we lose all of our utilities? Mm. But they all got pretty much wiped out. These are all attached units, all mm. you know, newer homes. Then they seen that the water came up here and then converged with the surge here. And when the water retreated back to the ocean, that's when most of the damage occurred. That's where the deaths occurred. People who died were on the other side of the house and the, and the, the surge and the Retreated. force of that water Coming caved back. in their houses. Wow. So most of the damage was on the opposite side. Where we are right here, this, this gentleman right here um, and his son uh, died in this house. And this mm. is, again, this is from, this, from the water coming in this direction. Even with this house protecting it, it just came over, I guess, over this house and crashed down into his house and it completely smashed in that foundation and they were in the basement right there um, when that happened. So you see the, you know, the larger structures, this was initially a, a, a bungalow as well, all the stuff over here initially just small bungalows. Mm -hmm. Not many of them were built. These two here I think might have been, the, the largest structure there might have been built as, um, I think it's a, it's a two family and a one family but they're you know, 3,000 square foot homes. But then as you go from here up to Mill Road, most of them are bungalows, especially mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. especially on uh, Fox Beach. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody's had it. You know, they just, they, they, as much as they love this neighborhood, they don't want anything to do with it. They don't ever want to come back. 
these are vast neighborhoods that were built at or in some cases below sea level um, in areas that had formerly been wetlands that really were designed by nature to, um, uh, to absorb the impact of a storm like this um, and therefore were incredibly exposed. What you have is not just low level geography but also a bowl where the, um, the beach and uh, Father Capadano Boulevard um, are slightly uh, above the level of the homes behind them. And so when the water came in, um, the areas were inundated, but then when the water pulled out, uh, which in other neighborhoods allowed people to recover and be rescued, it was stuck um, in these neighborhoods and you had um, uh, people who uh, remained inundated for a significant amount of time. The Bloomberg administration say that we are not going to give up on our waterfront, we're not going to abandon our waterfront, we're not. And I say, well, who is asking for that? It's a boogeyman that doesn't exist. Nicole, Mike, Vinny, uh, all the electeds who are advocating a buyout program do not want to abandon the waterfront. We're not saying you can't live east of Highland Boulevard. We're saying don't let anyone live on Kissam Avenue. Look at the aerial photo of Oakwood Beach and tell me which area jumps out where we should not have folks live and we can seed it back to Mother Nature. Shouldn't we take this opportunity to be a little bit bold and try to give those folks and redefine our shoreline and create a better Staten Island? And there's a lot of things um, that are now coming out in the press that are real issues. These people, most of them still had mortgages on their homes, so they're displaced, they're not living, they can't move back, they don't want to move back. They're terrified to move back. So they have, but they're still responsible for their mortgage, and now they're displaced, so now they're paying a rent. Ooh, and these again are middle class people, hard working people, who make enough money to pay their mortgages, but they certainly don't make enough money to make double payments. Mm -hmm. So we're in the process now of trying to figure out how we, you know, mm -hmm. how we get that handled. And we're not really sure how it's gonna be handled. So people are pressed for money right now. So through my prior contacts, I was able to find the right person in Wells Fargo to talk about these issues and how you can um, maintain this moratorium on payments, which is up to six months. And after six months, what they're asking for is that six months of payments that have um, added up for, for that six months, that have aggregated for the six months to make a one lump payment and it's impossible to do that. These people are still displaced. They haven't they don't have the ability to make those payments. They can't even make the monthly payment. So we're discussing about how do you just continue that for the buyout people for the life of the buyout. However long the buyout takes, that's when um, that's when that money will, will be will come due and will be paid by virtue of the funds received in the buyout. This is one of the few times where it's a win win. Uh, in life, and it really is a win-win because I'm asking the mortgage companies, not just Wells, all the mortgage companies, to understand the issues uh, that the homeowners have and the financial issues. But it's in their best interest as well to to um, to be to to really work with the homeowners, because in the end, the best exit for everybody, for the homeowners and for the mortgage companies, the banks, the investors, who have who hold the mortgages, is getting paid pre-storm value. And um, it's a really, it's a common sense thing, and, but it's in, it, and it's incredibly compelling. But when you add politics to that, you add the, the normal protocol, the normal procedures, what normally happens versus what's happening as a result of the storm, sometimes what makes sense doesn't happen. But the good thing is, the fortunate thing is, the governor is just really being incredibly caring and careful and understanding through this whole process. And he's already in, in conversation with the New York State uh, Department of Financial Services, which oversees the banks, and trying to get them to, to coordinate with the banks to do exactly what I'm talking about. One of the things I, 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 I did quite often the last couple of years, if, you know, when I prayed, I would pray to understand what I'm supposed to do. I always felt like I was supposed to do something. I didn't know what it was. And it feels like that this, right now, what's happening, um, the storm, the buyouts, working with the community, trying to inform people, st trying to stop people from panicking, is all been from 
drawing from other experiences in my life, you know, to a smaller degree, certain things that have happened, and I can, um, I feel like I can react much more quickly and much more efficiently because I've been preparing for it without realizing what I was preparing for. This is an interesting part of the block where this is, this is all part of the blue belt over here. You see one house over there that used to be a street that came all the way out that, um, Half those houses were destroyed. These people live in constant flooding now. I don't remember the last time it rained or snowed, but you can see there's water here. Any little storm and there's water right to these houses every single day. Could this have been seen coming? It was definitely something that was predicted, uh, which is uh, really amazing. If you look at like the hazard mitigation plan New York State has, yeah. it talks about the likelihood of intense hurricanes um, and talks about global warming and the effects of global warming and that we've had um, a series of events over the last 20, 30 years that they felt was going to culminate into a storm almost exactly like this. It was completely predicted. I have to get out and row here. <laughs> so when was the last time it rained? Anybody remember? But look at all this water. This is... Five years ago. Yeah. Look at this. Now there was a house here but they took that down last week. And now you have ducks where the house was. So there you go, see, see how nature wants it back? Wow. That's where the house used to be. So nature is saying, thank you very much. I mean, this is one of the original places, right? Wait, you see this? This is sort of interesting. You see this? Mm -hmm. that, that's from the storm. This is what came over the ocean. This is what it deposited right there. It's perfect for the birds because they're making their nests out of it and stuff. But it's not, it's not that it was an abandoned structure and the stuff was growing out of it. No, I understand. This is just that. stuck in there. Yeah. That's how high the water was. Yeah. So it's pretty hard yeah. to imagine. My tenants didn't get anything. And I, if you look in the back here, you see mine's actually raised up. Uh, it's like a crawl space underneath there. So you have the foundation, then you have the house. So, so after I mean, I asked them if they want to leave. You know, you got, you know, you guys want to head out, you can head out. Um, and I'll break the lease and I'll sell the place. But they love the area so much because it's a, kind of the beach area mm -hmm. and stuff that they didn't want to leave. But then when this storm came, a week later they moved to Arkansas. They, they didn't want to deal with FEMA. They didn't want to deal with anyone. So the only thing that they were able to salvage, now uh, Rapid Repair came in here and they gave me all new BX. They gave me a uh, whole new heating system, hot water heater. And this is all uh, off to the city somehow. I don't know how they got their FEMA funding, but they're just giving it to residents just to get started. There's no applications other than to sign up for rapid repair, and they get utilities going. So I got a new uh, electrical panel. I got all new electrical wiring. They were getting this, uh, this help to us without having to apply to FEMA. They just ordered, all you did was sign up for the rapid repair give them your address, and boom, they came as soon as they could. People who complained about it complained because it was called rapid repair, but there was so many people who signed up for it that it wasn't that rapid. And people continue to complain about it. There was an article yesterday about shoddy work and everything. But in this particular place, and I'm in the business, I thought they did an excellent job. So uh, the only thing that my tenants had left, they, all their life possessions, everything was in this little place. And so they lost all their furniture, obviously. I lost, you know, all my appliances and, and, and the walls had to all be taken out and had to be treated several times for mold. Um, the only thing that was left was, this was their bedroom and they had like a queen size bed. And the mattress evidently floated to the ceiling and the stuff that they threw on their mattress before they left, before they evacuated, were the only belongings that they were able to salvage when they came back, you know, three days later when they were allowed back in the street. So they took those belongings, they moved in with friends. For, actually, it was about a week or so, but it was a week and a half, maybe two weeks after the storm, after going to FEMA representatives, trying to figure out what aid they were eligible for, rent money, personal property type money, finding out they're not eligible for this, finding they have to wait for that. They got in their truck and they, they called me up and said, can we get out of our lease? You know, of course, I let them out of the lease, gave them back their security deposit, and they used that security deposit to fund their trip to Arkansas, and they moved to Arkansas. And I really haven't heard from him since. And so I think I think a lot of people, certain aspect, you know, from a certain you know aspect, you know, probably think they're envious of them, you know, or feel envious of them, that they got to get out because of people having a hard time dealing with FEMA getting the aid, talking about the mortgages, you know, where they're making double payments, or if they were renting, you know, you know where they are now, you know, versus where they were, 
um, and then continuing to get that rental assistance that seems that there's a struggle, a constant struggle. I'm a customer of yours, correct? I'm, I'm, I'm a rent payer to you. Yes. And you represent Stan, Staten Island. What do you feel about what's going on in Staten Island in general, in terms of money coming in, development, anything? Is this a place that has a future, the whole island? Outside the storm. Outside the storm. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's 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 interesting question. I think that the biggest um, the biggest problem with Staten Island, it's a problem throughout the country, but specifically in Staten Island since they built the Verrazano Bridge in 1964, is this overdevelopment because we basically were the country. You know, we had farms mm -hmm. here in 1964. Mm -hmm. The rest of the other four boroughs certainly didn't have any farms mm -hmm. left, and um, it's sort of like left to to the builders to figure out how they're going to carve up this and carve up that and the building codes were all relaxed to allow builders because they always justified it by saying, hey look, there's a demand, people want to live here, they want to have little condos, whereas before you had to build, had to be 50 by 100 for, to, for, mm. to be a buildable lot. So um, that overdevelopment has always been an issue here. There was never really a plan for Staten Island. No one ever sat back in 64 or 60 when they were talking about the bridge. Okay, well, how should we how should we develop this? What's a smart way? What's a good plan? It was everybody just like it's interesting because it's just like what I'm, af I'm afraid is going to happen with the FEMA money. Mm. That the money is there, let's just use it. Mm. That's kind of what happened I think in Staten Island because now the opportunity was there. The bridge connected us with mm. the rest of the city. So now the demand was there. Let's use it. Let's let's jump on that and let's create all these different communities. And it was never done with any type of a plan. So, mm. you know, we're, we're, we're still a unique type of um, uh, community I would say in a lot of ways because we still have the old Staten Island quality and people who come here sort of assimilate to that. Um, but um, but there's there's always a struggle between the old and the new. How do you feel that you were treated afterward? Did, did people recognize this as a crisis or was it ignored? Well, how's this for an example? The mayor of New York City, I think everyone was in denial and perhaps he was too. Mm. Um, the, uh, the marathon was scheduled for like the second or the third. Remember you know, his, his mentality was, hey, this is New York, we're tough, we're going on, we're yeah, moving we're on. I, I think that, personally, I, uh, every, uh, people were just so beat up at that point, they just they couldn't really focus on the fact that he wanted to have the, the marathon. Then as the day came closer, and, um, and it, the reality was setting in that they might have the marathon, people became angry. And it was that outcry that stopped it. People just did not mm. want to see that. Mm. And it was, how dare you? We're all mm. in pain. We're all mm. suffering. And New York has an, an issue that you know, we try to lead the nation, like after 9-11, saying we're tough, we come back. You know, nothing stops us. But there's a time to mourn. There's a mm. time to stop. There's a mm. time to realize what happened. Mm. And actually, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, in 9-11, that's coming back to bite us as well because immediately it was like we're tough, we're coming back, we're strong. They, they renamed the victims as heroes and uh, we're going back in there and they started the reconstruction weeks after that. You know, mm. take, first it was taking all, you know, all the debris out and taking it here to Staten Island mm. into the dump here. And then everyone went back to work within two weeks in lower Manhattan. And I went there a week after that, and I, the smell was, the air, was yeah. you knew it was mm. poison, you knew mm. it was horrible. But yet everyone, not only was encouraged, was forced to go back to work because we're in New York, we're tough, and, we could, mm. and now you look at all the lawsuits, you mm. look at all the people who are sick, mm. everything was because of that mentality mm. about we're going to go forward. Certainly we're going to go forward, but there's a time to stop, to think, and, and, and then go forward. Yeah, a lot of people like, kind of wonder, like, how do I think the way I'm mm. thinking? If I'm uh, a realtor and I'm a real estate investor mm. and looking for opportunities to, mm. to build, to, to speculate in, mm. um, the future here, in, me, in my mind, mm. is the past. The future is going back to the line. past. And that is going back to nature. That's, yeah. where, it, that's where it belongs. This, this is like a little, a little bowl yeah. that was created by nature. It's, yeah. it's at sea level, maybe below yeah. sea level, slightly above sea level. And it was a natural water retention yeah. uh, area that protects people who yes. are in, in sh you know, sort of yeah. away from the yes. shore 
from storm surges. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, it's a water retention area where they haven't built sewers up there. Mm -hmm. It's just water runoff that comes down here. Mm -hmm. So basically it's created, na nature and man have created a pool in the middle here where there's mm -hmm. houses that don't belong. Mm -hmm. So what I started to say before is the people who, who joined this buyout, mm -hmm. all the, our members, we asked them to write letters. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the thing that the every single letter says, every, every letter mm -hmm. says that houses never should have been built here. We don't belong here and we want to wow. sell our houses and we want to, the way the government program works is when you sell the house to the government, yeah. it gets returned to nature. They wow. demolish it and they take any s semblance of, of the house, the structure, the foundation is gone and it goes back to nature. But I was telling you about Dr. Fritz from, from CSI, the College of Staten Island. According to him, this storm was only huge in that this storm was <coughs> widespread. It had 800 miles from, so from south to north. Its effects were, were felt significantly under, over that 800 mile path. However, when it hit here, it wasn't even a hurricane. So his point is that if we ever got a category two or a category <coughs> three, and especially now here in Staten Island where the berm and the seawall is basically gone, that the, the devastation would be beyond spectacular. But um, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful. I think that Sandy uh, changed the perspective of a lot of people. Mm. And I think we have also sort of um, the city's attention and maybe even the nation's attention in terms of who we are, where we are, and uh, maybe from a, a more global perspective, um, the right things will be done.